Well, I invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll be looking at verses 11 and 12. We'll read through 11 through 14. But as you get there, we'll look at... I want, I want to draw your attention to a word that you find there in verse 11 and 14, the end of this section. You see the word inheritance. Really, that's, you know, the, the verse numbers, the chapter numbers are... We're not there by the original author. Paul didn't include those. Those were written, added much later. One of the ways they distinguished a portion, uh, a theme of a portion, was by highlighting, kind of bracketing a section. And so you see there that the inheritance is now becoming the, the focus of this doxology of praise that he opens this epistle with. And so it's talking about this future glory that we receive. But just as Paul has done with election and redemption, he elaborates on this doctrine with the benefits that accompany uh, these grand foundational doctrines. And so this morning we're going to explore the link between our inheritance and then the fact that that's predestined, that we are predestined to receive that inheritance, and that we do so by hope in Christ. And then over the next few weeks, we'll consider how our inheritance is connected to faith, to the seal of the Holy Spirit, and to praise, which we'll see that as well a little bit uh, at the end of verse 12 this morning. So before we read this section, let's ask the Lord for his help in understanding it. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word. We're grateful that you have given us this opportunity to sit under the preaching of your word and to illuminate our minds and our hearts. And we ask, because we're dependent upon you to do that work that we can't do. Lord, apart from your spirit, we can't understand and apply this, but we know that you can open our eyes to see. You can open our ears to hear. And you can soften our hearts to respond in obedience, that we would be doers of your word and not hearers only. And so help us to honor and glorify you in this time of worship. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Let's read it with me. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. This is God's holy word. Several years ago, I read a book that had been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize called When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi. Uh, it's a brilliantly written memoir of his battle with lung cancer. And it was actually um, published posthumously. Um, so I read it. First of all, I, I like to look at who wins the Pulitzer Prize and read good writing. Um, I, I just enjoy good literature. But Kalanithi writes really with just a depth of, um, of insight about life and death and passing on his thoughts to his newborn daughter. And so from the very opening chapter, I was glued, where he talks about flipping through the CT scans, um, that he had been, as a neurosurgeon, he had been trained to, to read these scans and to tell his patients what they mean, but here he is looking at his own and realizing very obviously that he has cancer. And so he goes on to write powerfully about conversations shortly after with his wife, about his diagnosis, about his, their decision to have a child together. He ended up dying when his daughter was eight months old. And it's not a theological book, but it does frequently wrestle with philosophy and just the, the weighty matters of, of life and death. And he did return to his Christian faith near the end of his life, but he writes this 
in one of the chapters, although I had been raised in a devout Christian family where prayer and scripture reading were a nightly ritual, I, like most scientific types, came to believe in the possibility of a material conception of reality. An, un, an ultimately scientific worldview that would grant a complete metaphysics minus outmoded concepts like souls, God, and bearded white men in robes. I spent a good chunk of my 20s trying to build a frame for such an endeavor. The problem, however, eventually became evident. To make science the arbiter of metaphysics is to banish not only God from the world, but also love, hate, meaning. To consider a world that is self-evidently not the world we live in. That's not to say that if you believe in meaning, you must also believe in God. It is to say, though, that if you believe that science provides no basis for God, then you, almost, you are almost obligated to conclude that science provides no basis for meaning, and therefore life itself doesn't have any. In other words, existential claims have no weight. All knowledge is scientific knowledge. I feel like that last point, that idea of, of just the, the hesitation or the need or desire to see all of life as being scientifically provable, I think there's some relevance here. The, it stood out to me as, as, um, as relating to our passage this morning because I think some people get hung up on that kind of inability to provide scientific proof of the spiritual realm, you know, something that we cannot see with our eyes. For others, there's, they, they might be willing to admit supernatural events, that they're possible, but they don't think we can actually know with any certainty about those events, about what they mean, about what they teach us. And so there's agnosticism, right? And then finally, and maybe even most common, because I think it's within the church as well, is that some want to believe and attempt to live a life of faith, but the frustrations of living in a fallen world fill them with such a lingering fear that all of it is doubted. Right? That we essentially become functional atheists. We say we believe in God. We might even act like that at times, but we live as if he doesn't have any impact upon our lives. And so Paul here is wanting to give his readers an assurance of faith. So he reminds them that what they have in Christ wasn't received because of their knowledge, wasn't because of some special insight that they had or goodness that they performed or abilities that they would do in the future, or, you know, that they would do for God. Their inheritance here very clearly came from God's predetermined will, which he ensures all things will work together for that purpose. And so I think we are inclined here to believe that our fickle emotions, that our frequent doubts, or even our difficult circumstances determine the course of our future. We live in just an assumption that's, that something bad is right around the corner. And because of that, we lack assurance of our salvation. Essentially, again, we function as if we don't believe in God. But if your inheritance was predetermined without your involvement, and the very obvious implication is that <clears throat> your receiving that inheritance cannot be prevented, and if it was predetermined without your involvement, then your receiving what God has promised cannot be prevented by anyone else, including yourself. So an inheritance that is predetermined is the first thing we're going to look at here that is predetermined by God. Paul has just concluded this section on redemption where he has brought us to the, the idea of reconciliation and union, right? He says, uniting all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So there's this idea of, of kind of cosmic harmony, working all things out for that cosmic harmony. And he is doing that by making Christians. And so where it starts in verse 11, in him, in Christ, the one who is bringing all things together, in him we have obtained an inheritance. 
So those who are in Christ become participants in the inheritance, or as he tells the Romans in Romans chapter 8, that we become heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. That is not something we do on our own, something God does in us that he predetermined to do. And it's because of our union with Christ that we then obtain an inheritance. The verb literally means allotted, but it's, it, it needs to be translated in a way that the allotment is passively received. So the verb obtain and receive is actually supplied. It's just one word in the Greek, but it's in the passive. And so we have to supply it, it to make sense of it in the English. Uh, you couldn't just say the, allot, the allotted portion, right, or something like that. It needs to be that we, we were made participants in that allotment. So you have to use a lot more words than what's there in the Greek. But it gives you the full sense of those united to Christ becoming passive recipients of a future allotment in glory. Here's how one commentator puts it, Harold Hayner. He says, the subject of the entire doxology is God, but the emphasis has changed from what God has done expressed in the active voice to what believers receive from God expressed in the passive voice. Sometimes commentators will call this the divine passive, where the passive implies that God is doing the acting. It's being done to us by someone or something outside of us, and the implication, if it doesn't give us a subject, the implication is that it's speaking of God doing that. So our ESV translation really interprets the passive as a middle voice, which I think is inaccurate, but obtaining implies sort of an action. Right? or even receiving. A better translation would be, we were made partakers of the inheritance. We were made partakers of the inheritance. That's how John Calvin puts it, how William Hendrickson puts it, among many others. So the divine passive implies that God is doing the action, and the text, again, doesn't explicitly state that God is granting our inheritance. It's implied by that passive verb. But it's the same thing that he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. There, the Father is explicitly mentioned, but the verb there is also a passive, right? He has qualified you. He has done that work of qualifying you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, this word of, of obtaining an inheritance or of participating in this inheritance is immediately followed by another passive verb, having been predestined. And so you have two passive verbs. The ESV here supplies eight words, which in the Greek is just two words right, to get the concept across. Obviously, there's a lot of meaning packed into this phrase. The intent is to emphasize how dependent we are, that we are passive in the process of our salvation. God predetermined how he would work all things out according to his own plan. And so there is a decided lack of involvement that describes the beneficiaries of God's redemptive plan. It's all unfolding according to none other than the counsel of his own will. So we play a passively passive role in our salvation. And that double passive serves to emphasize the meaning. Right? It was the ancient way of highlighting and underlining a point. And so if the double passives weren't clear enough, he follows that up. Paul follows that up with God's sovereign authority to work all things as he pleases. Notice he's not including anyone else in that concept, in that, in that process. He alone does the work, leaving nothing to the fickle nature of man. God takes into account. This is why he can be confident that his promises will come to pass. Because he's not leaving it in our hands. He alone does the work. He takes into account no one other than the counsel of his own will within the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, predetermining to make a decision. And so the Ephesians would have believed that fate, 
was in control of history. That would have been a concept they were very familiar with. Lady Luck. And they would have dedicated their actions in public to the goddess Agatha Tuke, which is Greek for um, good luck. And it's feminine. Uh, it's similar to the, the name Tychicus, which we've talked about before, but at the end of Ephesians, you have a reference to Tychicus, verse 21, so that you also may know <clears throat> how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. So we take from that that, that Paul sent this letter to the Ephesians through the, and the, the person bringing that letter is his, his friend and partner in the ministry, Tychicus, which means lucky. Right? It be translated lucky. So it's a name that is derived from this Greco-Roman myth, mythological um, understanding in that culture. You also have the same idea in the name Eutychus, masculine form of the same name, good luck. Uh, eulogy meaning, you know, giving a good word, and Tychicus meaning luck. So you have good luck. Eutychus means this, this young man who had <laughs> the terrible misfortune of falling asleep during Paul's long-winded sermon and falling several stories to his death in Acts chapter 20, verse 9. But these names represent, they kind of point to that cultural background that was steeped in Greco-Roman mythology. Nothing left to fate or luck in Paul's theology. He is, he is arguing very clearly against that view. God foreordains whatsoever comes to pass. The Stoic philosopher of ancient Rome, Seneca, who died uh, three to five years after this letter to the Ephesians was written, would have been very familiar, again, to, the, to Paul's audience here. He said, many have reached their fated end while they are dreading their fate. There was sort of this just assumption that it was that, that fate, everything was working out according to fate. It was all inevitable. That there was, there was no... Uh, no, deter no changing or having any impact upon what fate had decided. And so the philosophy of an indifferent fate was prevalent, and I think might, you know, we could argue is, is still something that people maintain today without associating it to a, you know, a, a Greek goddess. But I love how Charles Spurgeon responds to this. He says, we are no believers in fate. Seeing that fate is a different doctrine altogether from predestination. Fate says the thing is and must be, so it is decreed. But the true doctrine is God has appointed this and that. Not because it must be, but because it is best that it should be. Fate is blind, but the destiny of scripture is full of eyes. Fate is stern and adamantine. It's unbreakable and has no tears for human sorrow, but the arrangements of providence are kind and good. See, the only reason that we can have any sense of assurance in this fallen world is because we have a loving and faithful covenant God who is in control, who is working all things according to the counsel of his own will, even the hardships and trials. Mid toil and tribulation, he is still at work. And so there, this is an inheritance that was predetermined in eternity past. It's not tied to an ethnic heritage. It's not passed down through a particular bloodline. But it involved those who placed their hope in Christ. Now, why would that be important for the Ephesians to grasp? See, Paul has already assured them that they were chosen in the past and that their redemption in the present is just as effective for them as it was for the saints in Jerusalem. And now he is pointing them to a sure hope of their future glory. And so for many of us, the future is foreboding. It's ominous. 
Now we can't We can maybe take some time and recount God's past faithfulness. We can share that with someone. We can even name many of the blessings that we enjoy in the present. But for some reason, if we think about the future, that's when pessimism starts to come out. We're just filled with doubts. And I'm not even talking about doubts about the future of our nation or doubts about this decline in culture. I'm talking about doubts about what God is doing in your own life and in through you, about your spiritual future. I'm talking about those who lack confidence in the promises of God to preserve them and sustain them and cause them to prosper. And so we ought to be comforted and assured to know that our future glory is guaranteed in Christ. God not only conceived the plan of redemption before the foundation of the world, but he thought of you in his plan. Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it like this, We are not only in the mind and heart of God, we were always there. We are there now because we were there before the foundation of the world. And so meditate upon that. Give God praise for that. Assurance of faith is a matter of trusting that to be true. Knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life because he put it there before the foundation of the world. Nothing will change that. To the very God who wrote your name in heaven in eternity past will ensure that your name is never erased in eternity future. And so what is our participation in God's predetermined plan? Well, it says we receive it by hope so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might, might be to the praise of his glory. Now, there's a lot of questions about this. What what does Paul have in mind when he says, we who were the first to hope in Christ? Some suggest he's talking about uh, the early converts from uh, from Judaism to Christianity. So Jewish converts, he's writing to Gentile Ephesians. And, And they would say that because it says, so that we who were the first to hope, and then in verse 13, you'll see, in him you also. So they say he's making a distinction here between we... And you, the recipient, the Gentile recipients of this letter. I do think that that takes it out of the the general flow of thought as you're reading through this doxology where he is constantly talking about we, us, and our in an inclusive way of both Jew and Gentile. But notice that either way, whether you read it uh, one way or the other, the point that he's making is that Gentiles are no different than Jews, that that we are all recipients of the same blessings and promises that God predetermined by the counsel of his own will before time, before creation. And so he's making a statement about these believers in Ephesus who are receiving this letter. And I think regardless of how you read that we, whether it's consistent with how we've read what we read in verse 11, in him we have obtained. And he's not talking there just about Jews as if the Jews have obtained it and you are getting some benefit later on. It's, it's we all have obtained an inheritance having been predestined and then so we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. No matter how you read it, that's the idea is that we were all chosen before the foundation of the world, predestined for adoption as he said in verse 5, And so throughout this section, he's talking about Ephesian believers not missing out on any of the promises that any other believer has received. And so think about this this idea of hoping in Christ, which, again, he's talking to his original audience with the understanding that others will read this future generation future believers will read this and also hope in christ share in these same blessings did you ever just stop and think about that initial spark of hope that you enjoyed or experienced see hope is such a, a rich word 
that is associated with a childlike trust and faith. I know I've referenced my favorite novel a few times already, but Victor Hugo describes a beautiful scene in Les Miserables where he captures that childlike hope. I don't think the, the movies do it justice, or the musical even. But you have this section um, where we're introduced to Cosette, Fantine's daughter. And we know that she's been mistreated and she's been used by the Thenardiers, where basically she's just a, a servant girl. And so Jean Valjean comes and he, he's looking for her and he encounters her, doesn't know that this is who he's, he's coming across in the, on his, his path. But he, um, but he sees this, this young girl in the dark walking through the forest back to her place with this heavy bucket of water that's sloshing about. And, and he just walks up and grabs the pail and, and begins to talk to her. And he, said, he, he takes the bucket from her hands. He begins to ask her why she's out late, you know, what she's doing. Where's her mother? The child doesn't think she has a mother. I don't think I've ever had a mother like the other children. But oddly, instead of Cosette shrinking away in fear, she feels calm and relaxed. And as they head toward the inn, we read this. The man was walking fairly quickly. Cosette kept up with him without any trouble. She no longer felt tired. Now and then she lifted her eyes up to the man with a sort of inexpressible tranquility and abandon. No one ever taught her to turn to providence and to pray. Yet she felt something inside that resembled hope and joy. That wafted upwards to heaven. And so you can picture this innocent little eight-year-old girl mistreated and abused, sad, but now filled with sparks of hope and joy. That is something that's close to what hoping in Christ should feel like. The sorrow turns to gladness. Indifference becomes engagement and hope turns to praise and that's what it says here we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory see Paul cannot finish his point without making an expression of praise notice that both sections um, verse 11 and 12 as well as verses 13 and 14 end with that same phrase to the praise of his glory And so we see something of this common refrain in the Reformed community that God works out all things for his glory and for our good. And so that includes our future inheritance. We receive the inheritance that we did not earn or deserve in any way, and God gets all the glory. That's the end goal of his redemptive work. It's the purpose of our election to give him praise. Worship is the goal of our salvation, as John Piper says, and let the nations be glad. Missions exist because worship doesn't. We go where the gospel is not heard so that more will begin to worship God. And so we want to invite others into the worship of God. We proclaim the gospel because we prize the gospel. Because it's our hope. Worship is the fuel and the goal of missions. And so our inheritance is predetermined by God, received by hope in Christ, and that results in praise to the glory of God. And I pray that we would all rest in the assurance of that promise this morning. And that it would be evident as we respond with our mouths and our hearts singing this hymn of response where we will say, Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always.
Thou and thou only, first in my heart, high king of heaven, my treasure, thou art. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this picture, this image that you've given us of this inheritance that has been predetermined, that we passively enjoy and receive because of the work that you have done in our hearts. You've enabled us to receive it, to respond with hope and joy. And I pray that we would do so now, that we would lift our hearts up to you in song and praise and adoration, that you would be our vision for your glory. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.